Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals to state senators to mayors to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. I'm your co-host, Debbie Cox Bolton. In this special episode, I speak with Tara McGowan, founder and publisher of Courier. Tara is a film journalist and political strategist who spent years working with national democratic groups on digital advertising and marketing. Her passion for local journalism and democracy led her to founding Courier, a civic media company and largest left-leaning local network in the country, with newsrooms in nine, soon to be 11, battleground states. Tara and I talk about Courier's work, the rapidly changing media landscape, media's role in the rays of extremism, and how to effectively combat dis and misinformation. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you share it with your friends and colleagues. Thanks. All right, Tara McGowan, welcome to An Honorable Profession. Thank you so much for having me, Debbie. I'm excited to be here. I am so excited that you are here, and I have so much to talk to you about in a short amount of time. So I'm just going to dive in. I have people that I know are looking forward to this one. You know, we talk so much to elected officials and about public service, and I love doing that. But you're special. We're going to talk about local media and journalism, and it's such a huge topic. So we'll try to get to a little bit. But as I said in the intro, you are the founder and publisher of Courier Newsroom. So maybe let's just start with the basics, which is what is Courier and why did you do this? Yeah, sure. So I originally started my career in journalism. I went to journalism school and I was a reporter in broadcast and long form journalism for a little bit. And I got the political bug covering the 2008 presidential election and made a pivot into politics at that point into democratic politics. And I had a really interesting, very exciting, unplanned trajectory as a digital strategist, quote unquote, um, in progressive politics, really starting with storytelling that, you know, came out of my journalism roots and then and then moved into more understanding how the new social media platforms newer at the time, of course, were really revolutionizing communications and, and voter contact. And so I got into that world a little bit of distribution. How do we actually get messages across to voters where they are as the media ecosystem was shifting so dramatically? And I ended up running some of the largest digital advertising programs on the left, including a $100 million effort to defeat Donald Trump in 2020. And something that I became really, really focused on during all of that work was this growing segment of our population in America that I refer to as passive news consumers, which are actually just most Americans today, but people who are not very politically engaged. Maybe they vote in presidential elections once in a while, but they don't vote frequently or they don't vote at all. And yet they do share very popular values, but they don't proactively look for political news or information. They get their information for free by passively scrolling their social media news feeds their inboxes and talking to their friends and neighbors. And this population continues to grow because our media ecosystem has changed. You know, the rise of social media and big tech really cannibalized the advertising industry that made journalism possible in America, local and national journalism. And now news sources really rely on paywalls and paying consumers to stay afloat. And what that means is that they are not informing a growing segment of the population that's not used to paying for news and isn't going to pay for news. And because so much information is free, and of course, a lot of that information is not good information or verifiable information, that has really created a really big information crisis in America. That's where we see the rise of disinformation and misinformation and, you know, just more really, really salacious content and dangerous propaganda that isn't regulated. So a very long way of getting back to how I started Courier, 
I had run, you know, what I believe to be really effective, test-driven, successful digital advertising programs, but I was very frustrated that we were only communicating to this population that shared our progressive values in the lead up to the election with information about where and how to vote. And we weren't building relationships with them. And they were getting an increasing amount of really bad information that was either pushing them out of the process or really defining Democrats and progressive causes and the progressive movement in disingenuous and false ways. And advertising was not enough to compete with that. We needed to figure out how to really build trust with these Americans who do want universal access to abortion and want to see action on climate change. They believe in science. They want LGBTQ plus rights and racial and social justice, but they wouldn't probably call themselves a Democrat. And they increasingly didn't have access to good local or national information that helped them engage civically. So All of that is to say, when I was really doing some soul searching in this work in the lead up to 2020, I really felt that the solution was that we needed to build progressive media in America that was not an equal counterweight to the horrific partisan news we see on the right, much of which is about disinformation, is about sowing hate and division, but actually was true to our values, was factual, was ethical and moral, but also, you know, very transparent about our values. And also in this moment we're in, in this country, unabashed and unapologetic about calling out extremism on the other side. And so I worked really hard to convince some of the donors and backers of my advertising work to take a real risk and start a local news network. And we founded Courier in 2019. So we turned four years old this spring and we have newsrooms in eight states and actually just recently launched our ninth in Nevada and are going to have our 10th and 11th launching later this year in New Hampshire and Texas. That's amazing. I mean, and just to dig into that last piece, You've said it. There's a lot to unpack there. There's so much exciting stuff happening that you just talked about. But you're picking these states where you feel there's the most or the biggest concentration of these passive news. Yes, we are in battleground states for the most part. Unfortunately, I don't think many folks in the political media would refer to Iowa or even maybe Florida as a battleground state any longer. They are in our network. But Courier's model really can and should be everywhere. Of course, we're beholden to where we can get resources. And I started Courier in the lead up to 2020. So of course, most of the resources I could raise were in the battleground states for 2020. And I'm really grateful they were because we were on the ground in Arizona, which turned out to be one of the fire walls alongside Georgia in the 2020 race, but it is really driven by resources and where disinformation is most dangerous to our democracy, which is states that have an outsized influence on the future of our country because of the electoral college. So it's just a fact. And so I really do believe that our model should be everywhere and could increase voter participation everywhere by reaching this population, especially in states that are redder, but do have growing diverse populations. And yet, you know, we don't have unlimited resources, so we have to go where we're able to get funding. Yeah, it's an amazing model. And I love that you're really investing in journalists, you're investing in long form journalism, you're investing in actually just actually telling people what's really happening, right with an unbiased lens or grounded in facts. And I just think that that's actually like, you'd hope you wouldn't have to say something like, that's so refreshing. Like that should be what journalism is. But if that's so refreshing, right? You know? <laughs> I think you call it, what do you call it? Civic journalism, right? Which I really love that. That's right. that. I mean, we're always going to get labeled. I mean, even Axios did an announcement story on us the other day, and they kept referring to us as partisan media. I don't refer to us as partisan media because we don't stand and represent capital D Democrats. We share the facts about candidates and races and causes on where candidates of both sides stand on the issues. And you let the readers decide. We don't endorse candidates. But of course, we're going to be called by kind of mainstream, quote unquote, objective media as partisan because we do, we are transparent about our values. And that's something I would say that I just think that a lot of media in America, traditional legacy media, They have not evolved to the decentralized ecosystem that they exist within today. And I often say sort of a horse that I beat all the time is that 
objectivity is not the gold standard of journalism and information today. It's transparency. And objectivity is not believable to a lot of people. People want to know where you stand. And I really do believe that's also why content creators and social media influencers are so much more powerful as trusted messengers today than traditional news sources, because there is this feeling of a relationship that people have with them. They see them in their homes. They see them in their lives. They hear them talk about things from their makeup to their music favorites to politics. And there's something really beautiful about that because it really is more of an authentic dialogue and relationship in certain ways, but legacy media hasn't caught up. So I am very bullish on the fact that I think Courier is on the forefront of what news can and should be, as long as you're transparent, where the funding's coming from, what firewalls you have in place and what you stand for, and then let people decide, but never, ever, ever abandon the integrity of making sure everything is factual, verifiable. And that is something we take very seriously. I mean, you talked about how we got here a little bit with the point you made about kind of how the advertising has driven media and therefore driven, you know, the way that people have gone. I'm just curious maybe to talk about like, you not necessarily how we got here, but like just unpacking what it is that the media landscape, right? And so you mentioned a couple of things that are super interesting to me. One is this idea of bothism. And you talk a lot about that at Courier, which is, and you, you mentioned it in your remarks, you know, that this gold standard is supposed to be objectivity. So therefore that kind of in a world where we've got actually a political landscape, where we've got extremes. We're seeing it right now, right? We're seeing it with the Trump crazy what about him with Hunter Biden, which are completely different things, right? You know, there's just so much like, well, if I say something against someone, I have to pick someone on the other side and say something too. And it really distorts kind of where we are as a country and as a political landscape. So you're combating that with your journalism, but like, do you think it's compatible with other media, you know, at the national level too, just out of curiosity? Yeah, it's such a good question. It's such an important topic. And, you know, it doesn't get enough airtime in our national dialogue because the media does not want to, they don't do a lot of self reflection. <laughs> you know, they're in a defensive posture about this. But essentially, both sides is exactly what you described when editors and producers require their reporters to give equal amount of airtime or words in a story to both the Democratic side and the Republican side of an issue. That used to be a very good standard of journalism when both sides were good faith actors and being honest right, and held to the same standards of accountability and fact-checking. What's happened and why both sides of them has become so, so dangerous and detrimental to our democracy and to our free press is because reporters continued to elevate absolute unverifiable lies from the extreme right as equivalent to factual-based arguments on the left. And frankly, there are factual-based arguments on the right of folks that oppose the liars and the extremists, but that wasn't the parody that was ever provided in this reporting. So I have a dear friend and mentor, Mark Jacob, who's a longtime newsman and editor from Chicago, who I met him because he wrote this Twitter thread rant a few years ago that I was so taken by because he was singing my tune on this and really admitting that, you know, he had been somebody who had pushed for this and managed his reporters to this standard. And he felt, having done some soul searching, that both sides and, and even his contribution helped pave the way for fascism and authoritarianism because it gave them more of a platform. And so, and it's a very controversial and sticky topic, right, about free speech. But when we think about journalism and the media's role, it really is about bringing the truth to the public. And that's, you know, what their taglines are and, you know, democracy dies in darkness and all of these things. And yet this is a real fallacy and a real malpractice that continues in journalism. And so the way to combat it is to be unabashed about like, okay, hi, we do have values, but I, Tara McGowan, am a publisher of a news organization now who used to work in democratic politics. You know where I stand as a human being. I can separate that from the news organization, but we're still going to deliver you the facts and you can decide. And where we are today is that people are self-selecting, right? They are following who they want to follow. They're getting their information from those people, individuals and accounts that they follow. There are people like you and me, I'm sure, who we have 
you know, media diets that are very proactive. I listen to Morning Edition on NPR every morning. I read Axios. I read a lot of things. So many Americans don't. It really is just this passive consumption. And news organizations have a responsibility, in my opinion, to go to those audiences where they are and not assume that they're going to come to them any longer because they are getting a lot of information and a lot of it is bad. And the other thing I would say that news organizations of all sizes need to do a better job of is when they meet people on platforms where they are like Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Reddit, to produce reporting in a way that is accessible on those platforms, right? So you actually need to be personality driven on TikTok. So let the reporters be part of the story. And that requires an abandonment, in my opinion, of this kind of objectivity, non-biased lens, because we all come to this work with experiences, life experiences, backgrounds. And if we just share more of that, we can establish trust with audiences and then become the real vehicles for getting that information to them because you've established that trust. And I think the mainstream and legacy media have a crisis of trust right now with people who are not highly educated, higher income, frankly, elites in this country. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think that's so smart. And I also think, you know, it's, it is the what about ism or the both sides ism. There's also the, you know, the entertainment driving media piece too, which to me feels like we are then, you know, everybody just puts on the most extreme voices on both sides. There's nobody talking about solutions. We're only talking about fighting and problems. And that just, I mean, raises everybody's anxiety level. It, it plays into this like feeling like that everything is going to hell in a handbasket all the time. And of course, I mean, things are, I mean, I'm not saying, you know, I mean, we've got a crisis of democracy of climate with lots of things are not, you know, we've got to talk about, but you know what I mean? It's like, it's kind of this feeling that you have to have people up there shouting at each other that makes media. And I wonder, you know, what do we do about that piece? Well, this is what I call the disinformation economy. And there is not a really good solution for this because there isn't political will in the country to really regulate these platforms. But the reason for what you're describing, what I call rage bait, is because, you know, human psychology will tell you this for, you know, as long as we've been around, our civilization is that, you know, when you are emotionally engaged in something, so if something makes you angry, it makes you sad, it makes you scared, it makes you joyful, right? Like you have a heightened engagement with that content, that story et cetera. And that drives more clicks, more shares, right? This is why algorithms reinforce our existing belief systems, because you're more likely to click, share, comment on things that reflect something you already believe in or identify with. And that keeps you on the platform more so they can deliver you more advertising. And so social media platforms and media companies are really incentivized by how do we tap into people's emotions to get them to spend more time with our content and our accounts. And that actually alienates a huge swath of the population that is turned off by it and also really starts to see the country as much more deeply divided and polarized than it is. And like, yes, our voting electorate is, but in my opinion, that is a result of this media and information ecosystem doing this. Like, I think the media is more responsible for the polarization in America than even the right wing, to be honest, because it really does elevate small minority, but very loud segments of the right and left. And so I often say like, Courier gets, you know, as I mentioned, called partisan, called progressive, but we are not, our newsrooms are not state-based MSNBCs. They are not there to do the emotional rage bait or, you know, the like, you're in community with me, like the red meat and let's understand this together. It's really actually that would turn off our audiences that we need to engage. It's actually more about starting with the people, the communities, the humans, the impacts that policies and legislation and these issues have on their lives, and then connecting the dots for them to the decisions and the decision makers and how to vote so they can feel empowered and participate. And our two-party system and our media ecosystem is just neither of which are set up to really start to build that common ground. And I think that one of the solutions, and this is where it gets into the work that you do that I think is so important and the leaders that you work with do, is about how do we connect with people on a human level, on an emotional level, because that's where we can find that common ground and we can have a discourse that is healthier. The media doesn't want that because it doesn't drive as much views or engagement. How do we get around that? We have to build our own channels and 
we need leaders to understand how to communicate on these platforms like Jeff Jackson in North Carolina, who I think is an unbelievable example of that. He just keeps getting better and better like AOC, who transformed the connection between Instagram and Congress for her audiences online. And that is really part of your civic duty now, I think, as a public servant is to inform your constituents and break down very complicated issues and situations in our government, especially in this really volatile moment that we're in as a country. I hate to say moment because it's like we're on like year eight, but nine, but <laughs> hopefully it is a moment when we look yeah. at the long arc of history. <laughs> right. I think that's a really important point. And I, there's also, you know, I don't want to be in the weeds too much about this, but I was fascinated. I think Mark may have done it. Jacobs may have done a piece on this for you. So maybe that's where I saw it, but about, you know, even just the words that matter so much, I, I was looking down because I was trying to remember what it was, but like, it was, you know, when you're talking about somebody adamantly denying something, I think that was a, a, talking about the Brett Kavanaugh story potentially, right? So this person said something and he just, even the little words that you use are so subtle, right? But are so leading, I guess is the right word. And so, you know, bring your journalists on to you. Is that deliberate and how you even, you know, not just what stories you pick to cover, but how you pick to cover them. Yeah. I mean, I think it's another good point that you just sort of nested in that question is that, you know, there is always bias in media and journalism because not every news organization can cover absolutely everything all the time. So you are at the very top of the funnel making editorial decisions about what you cover and what you have your reporters spend your time on, right? So I think that's one important aside. I don't direct the language or anything of that nature or the assignments of any of our reporters as publisher. We have a firewall there, but we do have standards across the entire network. And we do have editorial coverage priorities across the entire network because we have to be efficient. Our teams are very scrappy. You know, I'm very proud that our newsrooms have five full-time reporters and editors in each of our states on the ground. That's more than a lot of news organizations in this country today, unfortunately, but it's still not enough to cover every issue and cover it well, and especially cover hyper-local issues like school boards and things that are so important and where, you know, these real battles are taking place today and will continue. And so the way that we think about sort of just our approach to this is really always centering our audience. What do we know about them? What do they engage with? What do they want? What information on? What are their experiences? And we do a lot of research on that and we get a lot from them because we're entirely digital. All of our reporting is Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and email newsletters. We know what they click on. We know what they engage with. We know what videos they watch and share. And so that really helps inform all of our reporters about how to do this work. And, you know, we set the standard at the very beginning not to be partisan that that was actually going to turn off these audiences. We are not playing to the base. We are not talking to progressives who are proud progressive activists or democratic voters. We're talking to people who these issues impact their lives and they don't feel connected. They don't feel informed and they don't feel like they can trust anyone anymore. And, you know, having done work in politics, the Democratic Party or Joe Biden's campaign, those are not the right messengers for these audiences to engage. It really is about meeting them with their issues and their values and then connecting the dots back to elections and candidates. Before we continue with our conversation, I want to remind you that we're going to be celebrating the release of our 200th episode and our five-year anniversary on an honorable profession on September 21st. To get ready for this milestone, we're looking back on some of the best moments in honorable profession history. Here's a clip from my conversation with Arizona Corporation Commissioner Anna Tovar, where she powerfully talks about her own experience battling leukemia and how that made her an advocate for quality health care during her time in the state legislature. I hope you enjoy. I implore you to use your experiences to be the voice for those that are struggling through that similar situation now, because your story, your experience will change and can change policy if it needs to. But we need everyone just to share their story. And it can be difficult. I mean, you could hear me. It, it is difficult for me because it brings back those memories, some good, some bad. But ultimately, use your experiences to help another person, to help a cause so that people don't have to relive an experience similar to what we've gone through. Just one more question on kind of this you know, how you think about journalism generally. Again, I also think that part of the problem is that we're so focused on the problems without ever talking about the solutions. This is something you and I have talked a lot about and that, you know, something I feel really passionately about, about kind of 
counteracting 30 years of government is the problem. Government is the enemy. There's lots of great stories about, you know, I don't believe government can solve every problem, but I think government is certainly as our collective way that we together rule ourselves and can do very good things for people. And so, and we have to talk about that differently. And so I know part of what you've been doing in your States is to lift up success stories. So and I think that's pretty deliberate. So maybe you could say something about that. Yeah, that's right. When I was in journalism school, you know, like the reason a lot of folks become journalists, it's very righteous. It's a very mission driven, meaningful work. And it's about really shedding light on corruption right? It really is about accountability. It's the fourth estate, right? It is part of our democracy that keeps our democracy together is be able to have accountability of big, powerful people, individuals, government, institutions, corporations, etc. And yet what gets lost there is then it, it really leaves just the political party system to be touting what they stand for and what they accomplish in government because the media is not incentivized. Journalists are not incentivized to talk about the good that government does when it does good. And that, unfortunately, the vacuum left of talking about the good it does plays into the right wing media's playbook and agenda to talk about government as a bad thing and to talk about Democrats as a big government, big spending party, because most of this country is more independent, right? They have values, but like, I think a lot of people agree government is a necessary thing, especially after the pandemic. Where would we be if we didn't have state and national government helping guide the economic healing of the country, the physical public health healing of the country? And so I do, I am actually curious about how a lot of Americans perspective on government has shifted post pandemic, not to say that it's over, of course, in this stage. So that's something that we take very seriously. It is one of the coverage priorities of the organization is to talk about the good that government is doing when it does good and to not over embellish it. It's just the facts, right? There is enormous economic development and job creation that is happening in all of the states where we have newsrooms because of bipartisan and Democratic-led legislation that was passed and signed into law by the president. President Biden, just by the facts alone, is the most productive and effective president in my lifetime, and I'm 37. It's just the data when it comes to what he has done for the economy, what it is done, what it's done for just, I mean, there's so much that this administration has done. Done. And so Americans need to know that as somebody who was a political operative for many years, I don't believe that understanding all of the amazing things that the administration has done actually motivates a lot of people to get to the polls who are not regular voters. I think the economy is actually an issue that's really for the most likely high propensity voters. It affects everybody, but it's really social issues and human rights issues and overreach of our rights or the rolling back of our rights like abortion bans that motivates the masses. And that is why I feel like Democrats have been so successful in the aftermath of the 2016 election is because they are fighting against these attacks on our basic human rights and freedoms from the far right. And it's more a referendum on the far right than, frankly, a celebration or an adoption or, you know, sustainability of what the left has done. Both matter and you have to cover both. But reporters are not generally incentivized to talk about it because it doesn't feel sexy and it doesn't create that emotional response that they're looking for. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Do you think that your model, both in terms of your nonprofit, we're a public benefit corporation. So we're a nonprofit for profit company. And that's just so we can operate as a news organization like any news organization can. And so, and yet we don't, our shareholders don't receive any financial return on their investment. It is a nonprofit enterprise, but technically a public benefit corporation vehicle. That's helpful. And I do know that there are other models out there, more nonprofit journalism, more like you're doing. I mean, so it's a super, I mean, it feels a little Wild Westy, frankly, about kind of the new journalism media companies that are or in organizations that are propping up. What do you think kind of like if you look ahead, you talked a little bit about how behind the national media is in just changing with the times, right? And everything from the platforms to the content to the, you know, dealing with the extremism. So like, what do you think, you know, happens at Crystal Ball in terms of like, what does a national media landscape look like in the coming years? 
Yeah, it's it's a great question because I really do believe that the media is in the midst of an existential crisis. I don't think they know where they're going or how to go, right? And of course, you know, companies have to stay in business. Nonprofits have to keep bringing in donations. We have a local news crisis in America. Over 2,500 local news organizations have closed in the past number of years, and it's not coming to uh, stop anytime soon because they haven't figured out sustainable models. I'm a really firm believer that to have good news, factual news at the local and national level in this country, it's going to need to be subsidized by philanthropy and potentially the government over time, which is controversial, but less so in other countries. And we really do need more regulation. We need the FCC to regulate digital media and news on the internet the way that they have for broadcast and otherwise. We do need to get back to having real standards and accountability. I am actually very pleased with the success in certain ways of the defamation lawsuits against Fox and other media, because I think that matters, right? Make people pay for their lies can have a real effect and be a deterrent to other folks to do the same. And so accountability really matters. But to get back to your question, where I think it's going, we built Courier to be nimble because we are also just entrenched in an incredibly volatile, disruptive moment in technology. With AI and the decentralization of of platforms and audiences, you need to be very audience specific and you need to always go where that audience is. So I really do believe we're entering the era we're already in it of niche media. And so it's going to be incredibly hard to tell the story about the media writ large and the impact because we no longer have a shared set of truth or messengers any longer. It's very niche. It's very difficult to monitor or measure. And it really is about understanding where people are being influenced, where they are wanting to get influenced by, who they want to be influenced by. And it's why I often say, if you watch the advertising industry and where it is going, that is where the media industry is going. And so right now, now, advertising today is entirely moving into content creators and influencers, right? Away from traditional ads. You're seeing it in politics too, always slower than corporate advertising and sort of national advertising programs. But that's really what's happening. And it really is a creator economy and a creator industry. And I think the right has been far more successful at building up personalities that drive enormous engagement and thus revenue for their brands, like Ben Shapiro, like Candace Owens, like, I mean, frankly, Joe Rogan, right? I'm going to put him in that camp. These are incredibly influential people who are personalities and build a cult of personality like, you know, Donald Trump, who we know. And on the left, we are just not as good at that because we have a higher moral bar. We don't want to be as salacious or as catty or as crass, right? And that's the stuff that drives the engagement. So it really is a conundrum. But I really believe that the left, and I know you are doing this work, and it's it's, it's really democracy's work, we have to build up our leaders. We have to make them really strong, effective communicators, and frankly, make them their own brands because that is what Americans respond to today and who they build trust with is individuals as brands and personalities. So I think that that's where there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the progressive movement is that we need to build more of our own media. We need to elevate more of our voices in ways that are entertaining, are compelling and engaging and not just about delivering the facts or explaining things, right? (laughs) We need to relate to people in order for them to trust our opinions, our perspectives, and our positions. Yeah, but hopefully not by the same way that they do, which I think is what you're saying, which is to drive division and so hatred, as you said. I mean, that's the thing, you know, I think we got to have a counterweight to that. That is, I mean, this is controversial. I mean, not a fight fire with fire. I feel like it's like the more we do the same thing, we're just perpetuating this terrible you know, degradation of our communities, right? I mean, I think we have to be entertaining. I want to be entertaining and also lift up people and lift up good things. And right, I mean, and just change the way we are. And I am not advocating for fight fire. I am somebody who often gets called out for fighting fire with fire. And my response is we fight fire with water. We do not need to do it that way. That way is detrimental. Not everyone on the left agrees with me, actually. Some of them are actually doing sort of more of that work. And there's also bad actors and grifters that do that work because they know it drives engagement. We can absolutely do it on our terms. We do need to be okay with being really human and really genuine, authentic, and 
to find ways to be entertaining and compelling because of the attention economy we exist in, but we do not need to sacrifice our values or the truth to do that. And I think that's where so much of the work that you and New Deal does is so important because it really is actually about how do people bring themselves forward, who they are, their experiences, because that's what's going to build trust and relationships. And they just need to have more platforms to do that because short interview bites on MSNBC or CNN don't give you who they are. So how do we really get more of people's stories and their backgrounds into the news feeds, into the bloodstream of the conversation? And I think that's where building more of our own media, more of our podcasts, more of our shows on TikTok, things of that nature can do that because people need to feel like they know a person to trust them and to vote for them. Yeah, and so that's, that's where it can't just be your positions. It's not enough anymore. Right. That's why I mean, not to you know, tap my own horn on my own podcast. But, you know, I do love the fact that on this show, we, you know, ask people about how they get into public service and what their story is. And because that's the most, that is so compelling. It's so amazing to hear why people, and, and to me, that's part of the story, right? Is, you know, I have so many non-political friends, apolitical friends who, you know, think all politicians are crooked or, you know, they do it for these crazy reasons. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, everybody I know that got into politics does it because just like you were talking about journalists do it because they want to make a difference. They do it because they want to help people. And when you hear their stories about something happened to them or they saw something they wanted to fix, right. And they wanted to make sure no people didn't go through that. It's so compelling and exciting and, you know, moving to me. And so I think we've got to tell those stories. So as we wrap up, maybe I might want to kind of end on a question, which is like a whole nother, we can do a whole half an hour on, but end on a question on kind of we're heading into 24. We know that disinformation, misinformation is going to be crazy and chaotic. Like beyond what you're doing in your own world, you also help people think about misinformation and disinformation. It's like, what advice to people do you have about kind of both in their own consumption of media, but also as maybe they talk to people who don't agree with them, you know, how do you help, un, you know, peel back the onion on all this stuff? So the number one rule that I always say about disinformation information, this is very much a well-researched standard is to never repeat it. It gives it more oxygen. Fight against that impulse to want to retweet it or repost it to debunk it or explain why it's wrong, because that just gives it more reach and more power. And so you have to fight against that instinct. The best way to approach disinformation, if you see it moving, and this is something that there's been a lot of research on as well, is something called pre-bunking, which is where you take trusted messengers on the topic of the disinformation. So for instance, with vaccine disinformation, health professionals in your community, doctors, nurses, um, other health professionals in the community being the ones to actually explain disinformation and the motivations behind it and show examples of it and say, you might see these things. This is why bad actors or people would be sharing this. This is why it is false. And it inoculates people because they feel smart and informed about it. So then when they see it, it doesn't have the same effect. You can't always do that, but that's a really effective strategy is what we call pre-bunking. The second thing is what we've really built at Courier, but that anybody can think about in how to engage in their own life, which is parity. How do you make sure as much factual good information is reaching people where they are as the bad information? Because a lie, if you hear a lie three times, it becomes the truth. But if you hear a lie three times and you hear the truth three times within there, you might not really know which one's right, but you're not going to immediately subscribe to the lie. And so really Steve Bannon's strategy of flood the zone is only effective if you're the only information flooding the zone. If we are also flooding the zone with factual information, this is exactly what we do at Courier, it weakens and dilutes the power and impact of disinformation and it slows the spread of it. So it's very, you know, there's no turnkey solution here. There's no silver bullet, but these are the ways that we actually can make sure that disinformation doesn't have the same effect. And then of course, there's the, the higher bar, which is also effective, which is was defamation lawsuits and accountability legal measures, because it really does deter people. And I think that has been, you know, really effective in certain ways, especially in just the nation's understanding of who to trust and how information is verified or not. Yeah. No, well, I think that's really smart and super helpful. Those are really like 
tangible strategies people can employ. So thank you for that. Are there ways people can, I mean, I really think what you're doing is amazing. I mean, honestly, I think that it is so important. You know, it's an all approach strategy, I think. Like you're talking about work we're doing with elected officials directly and on um, policy, but the media landscape is the backdrop of our lives, right? It's the floor. So I think that it's such an important work. Are there ways people can help you that are listening that uh, might yeah. want to learn more? Absolutely. And back at you, I think your work is so important, Debbie. So folks can go to couriernewsroom.com to see where our newsrooms are, share them with their friends and family who live in our states, our nine states, soon to be 11, because the more news and good information people share. Local news is very trusted. Ours is very trustworthy. Our reporters are trustworthy. Filling their news feeds, you never know what impact you can have by just sharing a story on your Instagram story or on your Facebook page or your TikTok. It really does make a difference. So they can go to the website at courier.news on Instagram. We have a huge Instagram following and they can find the other newsrooms there. And certainly follow me on the platform formerly known as Twitter at Tara E. McGee. But if they go to the site, they can sign up for our newsletters and stay engaged on the work that we're doing. But I am so grateful for our friendship, Debbie, and having been connected to you and the work that you're doing and being in this fight for a better, more progressive country with you. I cannot thank you enough for being here. This was a phenomenal conversation. I know our listeners are going to love it. So thank you so much. And thank you for all the work you're doing. We'll talk soon. Thank you, Debbie. Take care. An Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. Thanks to the team at New Deal for producing this episode. We encourage you to bring honor to public service. And because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars are used in the making of this podcast.